Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shiraz. I'm one of the Star Star Steering Committee members. I just want to thank everybody for attending today. Um, we have Hello, a full everyone. packed event uh, filled with loads of talks from a whole variety of speakers. But to start the event and a quick rundown of how we're going to be running things, I'll bring on Savesh, who is the Star Surge lead, to talk more about this. Savesh? Um, thank you, Shiraz. Um, so can everyone see my slides? So um, I'm Savesh. I'm one of the Star Surge senior leads. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, I'll just give you a brief rundown as to what the day will look like and what to expect from it so that you can make a full use of your day. Um, so firstly, it's important to say um, we've had more than 750, 750 registrations today, which is phenomenal. And we're really glad to have um, a great number of you uh, on board today. Um, so what will the day hold? We'll talk to you briefly about what collaborative research is, drawing examples from Star Surge itself, and also from our partners, EuroSurge, and also the recent um, a large international collaborative called COVID Surge. And we'll also hear from the National Research Collaborative, which is based in the UK. Um, and I'm sure as many of you are aware, we are running um, our next internet, um, European Prospective Multicenter Court study called Cascade, and it's um, together with Star Search and Eurosurge. And you'll hear um, more in depth and detailed breakdown as to the protocol and to the study design that went through developing Cascade so that you'll gain a bit more insight when you run the study and um, some of the data collection processes that go around um, Cascade. And, and you also have. To, you also learn more about academic skills, more around the UK Foundation program and what is how does collaborative research fit into EKFPO. You hear more about how to prepare your um, uh, how to run an audit and how to prepare for conferences, and um, you'll also hear from the British Journal of Surgery where we have um, the editors coming to give you um, advice and tips on how to write um, your paper from all the way from, from the initial phases and all the way to um, publication. So it's, it will be a very interesting session for you to join. And towards the end of the day, we'll talk about how surgery, academia fits in and, and what is it beyond uh, medical school and early days of surgical training um, and, and in, into your final years of training, um, moving on to being an uh, academic uh, surgical consultant in the future. So I'll stop there. Um, but the key thing is to enjoy the day. Um, this day is for you to so ask lots of questions. There's a wide range of um, uh, speakers that we have. And you can learn more about the casket study and you can learn a lot more about collaborative research. And interestingly, we've never done um, a launch event for the last two years as a result of COVID. We've never done a um, student-led or training-led uh, collaborative course study from Stars or uh, Eurosurge over the last year or so. Um, so this is an opportunity for you to get really stuck in and, and learn more about the process. Um, and we really encourage you to use social media, Twitter or um, Facebook. And when you do tweet about um, the event, please use the hashtag um, Cascade Launch. Um, and also, if you have any issues during the study, uh, uh, during the launch event, uh, feel free to just drop a line to cascade.audit at gmail.com and we'll aim to reply to you as soon as possible. Um, so that you'd be able to join in and resolve any um, issues. So with that, um, I'll, I'll stop there. And again, thank you for, for joining us today on your Saturday evening and really hope that you can take back a lot from um, from today. Thank you, Savesh. I'll stop there. Um, next up on the stage, we have Sam Brown. And Sam Brown is going to be giving a quick introduction to what we as Star Search do, what we've done in the past and what our future aims will be. Um, Sam? Uh, hello, morning everyone. Uh, so nice to be here, uh, nice to be able to chat to you all uh, a little bit about the study. Um, so I'll chat a little bit about sort of who Star Surge are. Uh, I'm the student lead, um, so I sort of look, look after the um, student side of things. Um, just to answer the questions popped up, yes, recording will be made uh, available. Um, as and when needed. Uh, so just a little bit about who we are. Uh, so Star Surge are a student audit and research in surgery group. Uh, we are the first student-led research collaborative 
Uh, we were established in 2013 uh, and have been supported by BGS Society since 2017. Uh, we aim to empower and advocate for students to develop and demonstrate academic and leadership skills. Uh, and you want to do that so that you can deliver some high quality clinical research um, that ultimately positively influences patient care. Um, that sort of is the bottom line as to why we do all of this. Uh, so how do we achieve this? Many of you will know um, sort of the structure. Uh, many of you will be either collaborators um, or regional leads. Uh, and then you would have seen ourselves the steering committee around. Um, so it sort of works down from a, a boots on the ground um, point of view that, that you have the collaborators uh, collecting the data. They're supported by the regional leads who are, uh, sort of organize more of the admin side of things, audit registration. Um, as well as allocating you to different sites, different data collection periods. Uh, and then that sort of comes up to the top of the steering committee. Uh, we're, we're brainstorming some new ideas. We end up working together and writing the protocol, ensuring that you've got everything that you need uh, to be able to take on, on the tasks that you're taking on. Um, so uh, there you go. Um, so I've sort of alluded to this already. Um, so just a touch of sort of upon my own journey, and I only mention this really so that for those of you that are collaborators or regional leads at the moment, um, you can sort of see that there is a stepping stone, there's a ladder to be able to go up. Uh, so I was a collaborator for a couple of years before joining the steering committee. Uh, and then uh, last year, I was, I was then sort of moved on to the student lead role. Um, so for those of you that are sort of starting out on your own clinical academic journeys, perhaps this is your first time involved in Star Search, uh, there's sort of ways to progress yourself, uh, take on more leadership, more responsibility. Uh, so fantastic opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, so Star Surge, sort of, we, we can describe Star Surge on standing for, for three prongs, being research, uh, education, and advocacy. Uh, when we're considering the research side of things, uh, the way we work or the way a collaborative research model works is different from traditional research. Uh, so traditional research, you might have it where you've got these 15 single center audits, uh, 20 patients at each individual center. Uh, which is good, but these are all single centre studies, uh, which ultimately are lower, lower quality in terms of research. Collaborative research model takes one multi-centre study, uh, which with a centralised data collection, and then suddenly you've got 300 patients across 15 centres. Uh, this does also sort of lend itself to authorship problems, um, because you can't have 250 to thousands of people uh, on the authorship byline. Uh, so Star Surge ourselves, we publish under corporate, uh, single corporate authorship uh, or collaborative authorship. So you end up with a single name um, on the top of the paper and then everyone's then acknowledged for their individual roles below. Um, we believe this is sort of the fairest way of doing it. It allows everyone to have their own acknowledgement for the roles that they've taken on um, and sort of let there's then less dis disagreement about who's first, second, and ultimately if it's down the line, who's 54th and 55th. Um, you can read more about that with on our website we've got an authorship document sort of explaining in more detail why we do things the way that we do in terms of authorship um so benefits of the collaborative research model you end up with your multi centers larger samples uh this leads to higher generalizability of the findings um, it also allows students to engage in meaningful research uh, i'm sure many of you would have either been offered or perhaps sort of dipped your toes into research projects that um, either just sort of tail off towards the end or they're very small scale and it's difficult to really know where you're going to make the impact um, for patient care. Um, and this sort of setup allows you to, to have much more impactful research, which then ultimately motivates you more to do some more research further down the line. And it's incredibly rewarding. Uh, we also feel that everyone here gets fair uh, and appropriate credit for their efforts. Um, which is something that can become more difficult um, when you're working on sort of traditional research. Uh, some of the challenges, um, I think it would be unfair to turn around and say it's not difficult uh, sometimes to coordinate the large group of doctors and students. Um, so it does require structure and a well thought out protocol, uh, which is why we sort of plan things uh, months, months ahead of time. Uh, and while we're keen for everyone to read the protocol so that you all understand sort of how things should go. Um, and it does sometimes require some expertise and potential financial institutional backing. Uh, this isn't so much of an issue perhaps for ourselves, uh, but particularly when you start working into 
uh, large collaborative um, projects similar uh, that sort of perhaps more RCT, so trials based, then you need to sort of have a lot more funding that are behind those. Uh, some of the previous projects that Star Surge have been involved in, so 2013, uh, start off the Star Surge study. Um, Oaks was then looking at uh, kidney injury after surgery. Uh, we then moved on to Imagine, which was a uh, collaborative effort with Eurosurge, uh, which looked at post-operative ileus. Uh, Recon was then one of our own, and that was your post-pulmonary complication, uh, sorry, post-surgical pulmonary complications. Uh, and then we had a compass a couple of years ago, just before uh, COVID hit, uh, which was looking at drains insertion in uh, colorectal surgery. Uh, and of course, now we've now moved on to Cascade, um, which is then going to be a cardiovascular complications. And so over that sort of length of time, uh, we've had over 35,000 patients uh, involved, 7,500 of you have been cl uh, collaborators. Uh, and this has sort of led to 22 papers being published uh, and more than 60 presentations overall, uh, which is fantastic for a group that, that is uh, overall student led uh, and fantastic for all the collaborators that have been involved uh, to sort of have that under their belt. Uh, moving sort of on to education. Um, so what we've got is, uh, you may have heard, uh, we've got the INSET platform. Many of you will have now seen the e-learning uh, which is up on there for Cascade. Um, so we developed Inset um, as a partnership alongside uh, Inspire, the Inspire Trust. And this was because we felt that clinical academic training or learning uh, within medical schools varied from university to university. And overall, it would be very difficult to sort of tease out the important stuff. The journey itself can be quite complex. Um, so we wanted to develop something that's free and openly accessible. Uh, and really it's for anyone at any stage of medical school uh, or training, anyone who's interested to learn more about clinical academia uh, to go ahead and access. Um, and we're also now able to use it for the e-learning for each of the studies as well. Uh, so current content, for those of you that haven't been on there, we've got clinical academic career pathways. Um, so how to get involved in research. Many of you will know already. Um, Star Search is a great place to start getting involved. And of course you're here, so you'd know that. Uh, you've also got your uh, AFP programs that are now being rebranded as SFPs for some unknown reason, uh, as well as the sort of the further clinical academic pathway um, and how that progresses as your years go on. Uh, we have some introductions into study designs, um, so this can help you better understand papers when you're reading them. Uh, perhaps you've got a research question and you then want to understand why you choose a certain study design to answer that research question. Uh, as well as sort of a touch upon in, into statistics. Um, so it's not a statistics course that's taught by a statistician. Uh, these are statistics that are useful for you to know that allow you to understand papers you're reading and understand research um, at a level that's appropriate as a clinical academic. Uh, some of the future content um, that's on the horizon. Um, so ASSET, the Association of Surgeons and Training, um, have some works uh, coming our way, as well as the National Research Collaborative. Um, and then we'll have some others as well uh, coming up in the future, but there's future content to be added. Uh, we're gonna constantly look to update it uh, and make sure that there's some fresh content on there. Uh, so some of the events uh, that we run, um, so many of you would have seen or heard about the regional academic surge evenings that were around last year. Um, so it was a uh, group, uh, Star Surge, Asset, and uh, SRS, who put on the academic surge evenings. These were ran by regional leads. Um, so many of the regional leads that sort of have been on for the past couple of years, uh, you yourselves, well done for running those events. They're a huge, huge success. Uh, and we did this because we felt that during the pandemic, students across the UK and Ireland had lost out uh, a fair bit. We were sort of exposed to surge and research, and we really wanted to sort of nip that in the bud and, and demonstrate that there is still ways to get involved uh, and how you can get involved uh, and try and sort of level um, some of the lost time from the pandemic. Uh, we also have the granule course. Um, so unfortunately, this hasn't been able to be ran um, past few years due to COVID. Um, but having personally done the course myself, this is phenomenal. You end up engaging with um, scenarios and actors. So you've got actual um, patient actors, very similar to Yorovsky's, uh, which allows you to practice research communication, 
Uh, and let me tell you, there's one thing taking a history, it's another thing explaining a trial to a patient uh, and really making sure they understand equipoise and consent and explaining it in an entirely unbiased way. Um, so phenomenal course, uh, and that's ran um, as part, alongside one of the trials units. Um, so really, really useful, particularly if you plan on getting involved in trials or doing foundation training and higher up. Um, really, really useful to have under your belt. Um, you'll do that alongside consent training and good clinical practice. And then you're ready to go to start recruiting patients into clinical trials. Uh, we also uh, advocate, um, so this is advocating for clinical academia, uh, student involvement in research, uh, as well as some of the sort of wider stances uh, that we feel are important in medicine. Um, so one of the main ones, uh, this seems uh, little old now, a couple of years ago, but um, we feel it's still really important, particularly with the pandemic, um, not such the pandemic, but particularly with COVID still lingering. Uh, so it felt very important to note medical student involvement in the COVID-19 response. Uh, many medical schools had different stances on, uh, on student involvement, um, some fully supportive of it, uh, others giving some controversial views uh, from time to time. Um, so, in terms of student support, uh, many of you will have known we had a national survey, uh, which we ran alongside the COVID MedEd uh, collaborative. Uh, so we had nearly 2,000 responses. That was from the majority of medical schools uh, and has since led to a uh, letter being published in uh, medical education. Um, so this has been really, really good um, to sort of demonstrate the outcomes of this, uh, which showed that there was an impact on students learning um, during the pandemic. Uh, we've also more recently uh, had the uh, UK FPO uh, changes. Um, so there was changes to FPAS, which was to remove the uh, edu educational achievement points. Uh, I'll sort of touch on this um, a little bit later uh, because there's a sort of a dedicated talk, talk through the results, what we found out of that project um, that we ran alongside. Again, that's it. And we've got RSM on there as well. Um, so. We, uh, we know a little bit about sort of getting involved. Many of you are here, so you already know how to get involved, um, but also why. Um, so we've got patient uh, benefit, which I've touched upon. You've got your personal development. Uh, there's also a huge part of networking as well. Um, surgery and surgical clinical academia uh, is a very close-knit world. You'd be amazed. You meet one or two people, and it's just a chain reaction of people that you then meet down the line, and these are all going to be absolutely invaluable. Uh, to your future careers. You just never know what someone can do for you uh, down the line. So just meeting everyone, as many people as you can, and just knowing who's who, where they are, having them in your back pocket is possibly one of the most undervalued things um, within uh, clinical academia. Uh, and then, of course, it's also useful for, for CV building um, as well. Uh, I know a lot of people sort of go number chasing or, or points chasing in terms of uh, publications, presentations, but it's nice to have meaningful publications and presentations attached to your CV as well. These are the sorts of things that if you end up being asked to interview, you can really expand on them uh, and sort of demonstrate that there's more to it than it just being a name um, in your CV. Um, so, uh, that's pretty much uh, sort of who we are as Star Surge um, and what we do. Um, we'll sort of leave questions uh, and, until the end for this one, um, just so that we can sort of move on promptly with the time. Um, but yeah, thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Sam. I'll just remove your PowerPoint. Thank you very much for that talk, Sam. Um, just in the interest of time, uh, we'll move on to the next speaker, if that's okay. So the next speaker we have, uh, Dr. Kenneth McLean, who is the ex-Star Surge lead, uh, former Star Surge lead, I'll say, and is currently the uh, National Research Collaborative Surgical Representative. So you're just going to build on Sam's previous talk and talk more about the collaborative research model. So over to you, Kenny. Brilliant. Uh, thanks very much. Hopefully everyone can hear me there. Uh, yes, I, I promised it was a, a democratic uh, change of power and I wasn't usurped. Um, I was quite happy to, to move on, leave it in safe hands. Um, so uh, one of the other uh, hats I, I sort of wear is um, there's a group in the UK called the National Research Collaborative. Uh, so when collaborative research first started, you know, almost a decade ago now, um, there 
you know, was initially uh, focused in surgical collaboratives, uh, and then as uh, particularly the ones started in the West uh, West Midlands in the UK, uh, and then that when people sort of realised how valuable this sort of model was in terms of delivering research and delivering um, good patient oriented research, uh, more and more groups have sprung up, uh, and the kind of idea behind this is to, you know try to get collaboratives talking to each other, working together, and almost like encouraging collaboration amongst collaboratives uh, to try and uh, encourage more people to get involved, to share, um, you know, things that have gone well, things that have um, gone less well, and things that other collaboratives can learn from. Um, so that's kind of what the group um, is all about. Uh, and we kind of help support different collaboratives around the UK and actually increasingly internationally in terms of delivering uh, collaborative research. Uh, so some of the slides might be a wee bit familiar um, from Sam's talk, but hopefully can offer a wee bit of a different perspective. Um, so as was kind of discussed, the traditional research model is very much everyone working in silos. Uh, and, you know, increasingly, so I, I, I sometimes uh, review abstracts for conferences. And one of the sort of biggest issues is you can have a really, really fantastic research project it can be a really interesting topic. You can have the most fantastic methodology in the world. Um, but if you only have 20 patients that you're kind of doing this with because you're at a small uh, small hospital, it's not necessarily got a, a large influx of patients coming through, uh, there's only so much you can do, only so much you can answer by yourself. Um, so just working um, with that other hostel across the city um, working with um, a group of hostels uh, in your area, in your region, in your country. Uh, by doing that, you can uh, answer much bigger questions. You can answer questions much more effectively um, rather than everyone just working in silos um, and not necessarily uh, working together. So collaborative research is the kind of idea that um, you're all, you know, singing from that same hymn sheet. So you're you're all collecting the same data in the same way. Uh, you're collecting it centrally, um, uh, which is obviously kind of requires quite a lot of coordination to make sure that everyone's doing it at the same time in the same way. Um, and you're gathering all that data centrally to try and answer um, the core research question of whatever or core audit standard of what you're trying to do with it. Um, so while it initially started with um, what's called clinical audit, which is um, a sort of specific thing to UK. I know there's um, obviously international collaborators here. It's a kind of very specific thing to UK that is formally recognised uh, clinical audit as this particular thing. Um, whereas uh, increasingly we're starting to do things that involve, so clinical audit is uh, collecting data which is just routinely collected on patients, comparing it to um, what is the correct standard for that um, research. So for instance, saying that uh, all patients before surgery have to have their BMI recorded. Uh, and uh, so they need to have their sort of BMI recorded and making sure that all patients do that. And if it's not, then doing something to make sure that that is, is then uh, recorded, maybe informing staff that they need to collect that. And um, so it's increasingly expanded now to uh, research studies. So um, collecting patient reported outcomes after research, Trials even have been delivered. So there's been several trials in the UK which have been delivered. Uh, one called Sunrise is being delivered across the UK and Australia, uh, which is fantastic. So there's increasingly um, trials being delivered in this manner um, across the world. Uh, and you know, just to give an example of the kind of different roles within it. So you've obviously got um, what are called kind of local collaborators. So that's uh, data collectors who are obviously you know, on the ground, um, collecting the, the information that we need to answer the questions, uh, are often the ones presenting the results back to the local departments, uh, and then hostel leads, uh, so they're the people um, sort of in a bit of a bit more of a position of responsibility in that they're trying to coordinate things and structure things across that centre and are often the um, people who are getting the approvals for that. Uh, and then you've obviously, you, you might ha also have regional leads or national leads who coordinate a big, bit bigger uh, uh, a region, uh, but you've also got the, the sort of steering committee who are kind of more involved in the overall coordination, designing the protocol, um, often kind of leading the sort of write up for papers and that kind of stuff. Uh, and as Sam's already kind of talked about, um, we've got the sort of collaborative authorship side of things. So this is kind of core to um, the collaborative research model in the sense of 
everyone's getting the appropriate recognition. Uh, and certainly within um, Star Surge and other uh, similar uh, research groups, um, we have what's called single corporate authorship. So making sure that um, it's not, you know, viewed as just the steering committee or the writing group having all the credit, having all their names in the paper. It's really important that actually this is recognised as a group effort. This is everyone contributing everyone's work. And therefore, it's the collaborative as a whole, including all the collaborators who are recognised. Um, and obviously that uh, all the, the individuals involved are listed on PubMed and then also in an appendix in the paper according to their respective roles. So it's actually, to be honest, I'm biased, but better than um, traditional authorship because often, you know, if you've got just got names listed on PubMed, you don't know who's done what. Um, but if you've got all the names listed by their roles on um, on the paper, that means that you know exactly who was involved in data collection, um, who was involved in writing the paper, who was involved in uh, validating the results and so on. Um, so within the UK, this has certainly taken off and increasingly, particularly in surgery, um, almost all centres involved in uh, doing surgery in the UK have been involved in some sort of um, uh, collaborative project. So it is getting out there and um, increasingly across the world now it's um, becoming involved um, with, you know, particularly with things like global surge and COVID surge. Um, hundreds if not thousands of centres across the world and in different countries are, are getting uh, stuck in uh, and contributing data to these things. Um, so as I've mentioned, uh, National Research Collaborative, um, there's now something about 50 different collaboratives across um, surgery, medicine, anaesthesia within the UK. Um, so it's certainly um, definitely taken off here. But then increasingly, uh, as I've said, uh, international collaborative groups, um, some of which um, will be how the, uh, some of our international collaborators collaborators here would have got involved. So things like PT Surge, Sigma, Tasman, um, It Surge, all of these groups um, coordinate projects uh, on a sort of national basis, um, not just in general surgery. So there, it's um, most commonly general surgery collaborators, but there's increasingly urology, vascular, neurosurgery, and so on. So if you've got other interests, um, there's certainly collaborators out there for you. Um, I'll not necessarily reiterate everything Sam said here. Um, I, we're obviously biased in terms of we think this is a really great model and how to get involved. It's great, particularly for people who um, haven't necessarily been involved in research before, who want to get to terms with how you set these up, um, how you collect data and so on. Um, I, I think it's a really accessible way to get stuck into research and get involved. Um, so happy for any questions, depending on timing, but um, otherwise, thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Kenny. Um, but again, just for the interest of time, we'll move swiftly on, if that's okay. So I'll just remove you from the screen. So everyone, so Cascade is obviously an international audit um, in combining the efforts of both Star Surge and Eurosearch. So we've already heard from Sam Brown talking about what Star Surge is and what we have done. But I'm very grateful to welcome uh, Ruth Blanco onto the stage, who is one of the Eurosurge co-leads. We will be talking not only about what your research has done in the past and their future endeavors, but also the impact of international collaborative research. Ruth? Hi, all. I'm going to share my slides. Wait. No. So, um, good morning, all. I'm Ruth Blanco. I'm currently your search collaborative colleague together with Alessandro Sgro. I'm surgical trainee at Hospital Valdebron, Barcelona, Spain. And in my talk, I'm going to talk about uh, two things, Eurosearch and also student-led international research collaboratives. So starting with Eurosearch, uh, some of you are part of it. Some of you will be new today. So just to let you know that Eurosearch is a European medical students and surgeons network who collaborate together to run multi-center international student-led and trainee-led uh, so far cohort studies. So following the collaborative model that already Kenny has been have, have exposed in, in his previous talk uh, and it was previously developed by Star Search and Global Search, so medical students and trainees uh, met in the European Society of Coloproctology meeting in Dublin 2015 and exposed that ideas and, and new ideas for a, for a project to be run in Europe. 
following the collaborative model. And that's how uh, your search was born. Uh, in the first study, just with seven countries, and then it grew. So um, a Eurosearch aim uh, to help developing research networks. Uh, sometimes there, there is already a national network well developed. Sometimes in countries taking part in our projects, it's not so easy. So uh, the idea is to help them to, to establish these networks. Also to provide uh, research skills to students and trainees. Uh, it's not so common to be involved in research in all in all parts of uh, Europe, so it's also uh, the idea to give the chance to take part in this kind of studies. And our major goal is to improve patient care. You will see that these aims are shared by uh, most of the collaboratives uh, that are, have been presented today. Uh, behind Eurosearch, who are we? Well, um, first of all, Eurosearch is made by all uh, their collaborators collaborators that take part in our projects, collecting data. Those who lead their mini teams are the teams at the hospital, the supervising consultants, uh, regional leads and national leads that are part of the committees and, and the collaboratives and help to coordinate the study at their countries and local regions. And also the steering committee and the advisory group. These are just few fixtures before COVID. Hopefully uh, we will be able to, to meet again face-to-face -face, uh, next uh, meeting in Dublin 2022. Uh, about year such previous studies, well, um, most of them are shared by StarSearch. Uh, in 2016, we developed our first project, year such one. In 2018, it was our second project, Imagine, and in 2020, our latest Compass. So after Cascade, the idea will be to run uh, our fourth study. Just uh, to summarize some of the ideas and, and results from our previous uh, research, uh, regarding the first project, Eurosat one that was, was about BMI complications, uh, BMI and complications following major gastrointestinal surgery, when we compare obesity and, and BMI, uh, we didn't show um, the relation with 30-day major complications. For imagine, we assess ileus in in the colorectal resection and reversal stoma patients undergoing elective procedures, and we get to involve more than 4,000 patients. One of the important achievements of this project was that uh, in Eurosearch network stopped being something European and became something international as we get centers involved in South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. And as previously exposed, um, Eurosearch was a conjunction of, of other collaboratives as well. Imagine try to answer different questions. One of them was if NSAIDs could reduce ileus. We didn't find significant difference in terms of J gastrointestinal recovery. We found that fewer patients with NSAIDs required a strong output analgesia, and NSAIDs wasn't related uh, to acute kidney failure or anastomotic leak. Also, we assess uh, the, the safety of early discharge. Um, we didn't find a significant difference in terms of readmission rates uh, for those patients um, being discharged before re complete return of bowel function, before the passage of a stool, compared with those uh, after return of bowel function. And for Imagine also, we assess uh, the use of prophylactic nasal acid tube uh, in order to reduce the rates of pneumonia. And we didn't find a uh, difference when comparing with the reactive uh, tube placement uh, for those vomiting after surgery. So uh, we uh, recommend that not to use prophylactic nasal acid tube as it's not associated to the reduction of fewer cases of pneumonia after surgery. Our later study compass was about management of complicated intra-abdominal collections after colorectal surgery. Uh, current evidence and even EDERS guidelines uh, recommend against the use of prophylactic drains. Uh, but in Imagine survey, we found that 35% of the centers taking part in our project left drains for most of their patients. And we wanted to assess what was happening. So uh, we developed this study. Uh, including patients undergoing elective and emergency surgery in correct, uh, in correct uh, procedures in our network, previously thought from February to April 2020, and assessing 30-day complications. However, COVID came in 2020, and we need to adapt to new barriers and difficulties. We need to take difficult decisions. Uh, that was something new for, for our collaborative. We need to consult some periods and to validate the previous data as it was on time for the first outbreak of COVID. 
Nonetheless, we get to involve uh, 180 centers with more than 1,080 elective procedures, most of them corresponding to malignant procedures, 30% rectal surgery. Uh, when we assess the reasons for leaving a drain, we saw that most of them, 64% was because of prophylactic drain. That's our data related to elective procedures. And um, excessive intraabdominal fluid was uh, the second reason in 50% of the 15% of the cases. The overall prophylactic drain placement was 35%, which is high uh, in elective colorectal surgery. And we found that drain placement may prolong length of stay for the, that patients and even the risk for surgical site infections. Well, apart from Eurosart, uh, there exist other current networks that uh, even have been mentioned before in the previous talks. Uh, they are student-led collaboratives. It means that students are part of their committees and help to coordinate the studies together with other trainees or, or supervising consultants. But students are a key uh, piece in, 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 the, in these collaboratives. Most of them take part uh, as part of your research and help coordinate this, their studies, Star Search in uh, UK and Ireland, IT Search in Italy, PT Search in Portugal, Sigma in Germany, Tasman in New Zealand, and some and strife in, in West Australia. But there are many other ways to collaborate as a student in in, in international research collaboratives, like uh, or, or national. Uh, for example, uh, urology bars, uh, vascular burn, internationally global search and COVID search. Uh, they are not student-led uh, collaboratives, but they include some students in their in their committees and even in their studies. And there are other chances, maybe multi-center multi studies that use the collaborative model as previously in the past, Rift or, or OA. So if you're a student, uh, please be aware of these opportunities and, and get involved. The future steps for your search is Star Search. Well, you may, you may know Cascade. That's the reason because uh, we are all here today. Uh, for your search after Cascade, the idea will be to develop the next project after, after it spring and summer. The idea will be to be able to present our next project at the ESCP meeting in Dublin 2022. It will be uh, also the, our, our seventh anniversary as collaborative. So the future is yours. It all depends on, on the collaborators and, and future projects we can achieve as a group. Finally, I would like to talk why do students need to, uh, research collaboratives? What to get, uh, to get involved? It's all about its term, uh, international research collaborative. If we get these three pieces, we see that for international, uh, the reason would be that as a student, you will be able to be part of an international network and may uh, meet other colleagues across the globe, which is important. Uh, research, because you help students to understand surgery from another view, to develop research skills and to haze, enhance interest in academic surgery. And this is important because in some places it's quite easy to get involved in research as a student, but in other countries, uh, in, in Europe, it's not as easy to get involved as a student or even as, as a resident. So it's a great chance for, for you to, to, to be part of a collaborative. And finally, collaboration, because it helps you to develop teamwork and leadership skills uh, that are important for you uh, in research, but also in your future as surgeon and doctor in a healthcare uh, framework. It's not only important uh, for students to get involved in collaboratives, but it's also important for collaboratives to get, get in students involved as they can give you new views on, on a study design and in innovative um, things to collaborate together. So as Mati Stepanek said once, I would say that unity is a strength and whether, when there is teamwork and collaboration, uh, wonderful things can be achieved. And that's the reason for the previous achievements for Eurosearch and Star Search. So um, thanks very much for, for your attention. And now I'm going to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, I do not think we have any questions at the moment, um, but again, just because we're running very well to our schedule, I will just um, invite our next speaker. So it is our first keynote speaker, uh, Miss Elizabeth Lee, an, NA, an NIHR doctoral research fellow in surgical innovation, along with being an SD6 in colorectal um, surgery. 
And she's also a part of both the COVID surge and global surge initiatives. So hello, Miss Lee, and she will be talking to us about the effect that collaborative research has had over the last two years with the COVID-19 pandemic. Over to you. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much for this very kind invite. And um, it really is an honor listening to these other talks, um, hearing about the achievements of um, everybody that's here, that what we want to and intend to do in the future. And, um, oh, I don't know if my... Um, We're not able just... to see your slides right now, Miss Lee. Yeah. I was able to see them for a second, but they seem to have disappeared. Let me just try again. So I've started sharing, does it, that's it, perfect, are. great, thank you so much. No um, so I wanted to um, uh, really go over the, the whole COVID surge project and um, what that um, entailed and also what we're looking forward for um, in the future as well. Um, and uh, yes, uh, once again, just congratulations on what has already been achieved and I'm certain it's going to be a very fruitful um, project. So when the pandemic first hit, we had um, really no evidence whatsoever about the effects of COVID-19 on um, patients in general, let alone surgical patients. It was well-meaning uh, opinions, but there was no um, real patient-level data. So COVID surge really intended to do two things. Firstly, was the mission was to provide high-quality data-driven guidance to surgeons um, across the world during the pandemic with um, evidence base and um, uh, real time and very fast moving uh, results. The second really was to, um, from our data, we generated a number of papers and we wanted to impact this upon the world and really translate this into clinical practice and also directly improve the treatment of our patients. And um, we had um, a number of publications as well as um, this was translated into numerous guidelines, including the World Health Organization. We were able to generate funding for future projects. We were also able to, to um, direct this and get mainstream media coverage, which is something I will go a touch on later as well. So this is the, uh, the, 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 uh, the famous um, first paper that was published in The Lancet. And uh, we learned a lot of lessons from this paper. We, we knew that this data was very important. And what we found was that in hospitals with unrestricted access um, to patients, uh, in other words, none of it was um, uh, green hospitals or areas that were um, ring fenced to not admit COVID patients, um, we had a 24% risk for post-operative mortality. And just to put this in context, in emergency surgery in general, in over 70-year-olds, mortality is only around 15 to 17% from pre-COVID data. Um, this paper was submitted with 200 patients, but when it was actually accepted after revisions, we had over 1,000 patients. And now, as later you'll see, we have almost um, 200,000 patients within the portfolio itself. So what this paper definitely showed was that um, patients were at major risk of post-operative mortality um, if they had surgery with perioperative SARS-CoV-2. And um, we demonstrated that this was true definitely in patients who were over 70 male having emergency surgery, but also in patients having minor surgery as well. And this really brought attention to um, this unsuspected group that were uh, also at um, much higher risk. So the portfolio expanded quite um, organically and naturally, and we went on from the COVID surge cohort study into um, the cancer study, which looked at patients with and without um, uh, COVID, and also went on to look at um, patients later on in the pandemic in October of 2020 in the surge week study. 
In total, um, the network has expanded to include data from over 190,000 patients, uh, over 2,000 hospitals globally, and over 120 countries. And it really did um, ring out to how wide the network could spread from word of mouth, from grassroots moving upwards, but also from top-down dissemination as well. And I think this is something that you have all been able to do extremely well as well. And what we were able to do is that we tried to unpick the patient pathway. So it wasn't a singular um, uh, point of contact that we were interested in, such as the operation itself. We tried to unpick every part of the pathway that the patient would come in contact with with surgical services so that we could improve or attempt to um, give guidance to improve their entire journey and ultimately reduce the post-operative pool um, mortality rates, which included vaccination, the timing of surgery itself. And what we wanted to do was provide the infrastructure around the data collection as well. So um, to deliver all of these projects, what we tried to do was release a very simple and very lean protocol, actually, something that was easy to approve by local um, centres that essentially was just two pages with a very pared down and CRF. And this provided um, a project that was easily um, executed by um, collaborators, very little burden to them because many of them were already very much overburdened by um, the current clinical situation in their hospitals. And um, this meant that we were able to execute these projects quickly as well as effectively and also reduce down the, the uh, amount of missing data and the dropout rate that we had. Um, and uh, and uh, after the fast approvals, um, patient relevant questions was something that we wanted to focus on. So um, instead of trying to broadly capture a lot of things, we really wanted to answer a few key questions with a couple more data points to support that as well. And um, the other thing to really concentrate on is that um, what these projects were, were that they uh, address issues that cut across every single speciality. And um, there is always a um, need for niche studies in surgery that answer very specific um, uh, questions about a particular part of surgical services. But there also is a need to tackle um, problems that really affect all patients, such as COVID and post-operative pulmonary complications. So we had um, uh, specialities from orthopedics as well as cardiothoracics and beyond that were involved in this. And it really did help to unite the entire uh, network as well, having this um, more broad base um, intent across um, everybody that was involved. And some of the key COVID surge messages included vaccinating all elected patients before surgery, PCR testing three days before surgery, careful consideration uh, for whether patients do or do not need isolation because it can actually have detrimental effects if patients are um, really kept at home and not mobile for the period of time where they really do need to optimise their physiology the most risk scoring patients as well beforehand so that you can have um, a clear conversation with patients about what they might be entering into if they do have surgery around uh, and do get COVID. Um, provide surgery in a COVID-free pathway, of course, either in a separate unit or an entirely clean hospital, um, ward, theatre or critical care. And um, also looking at the important factor of background community risk of COVID as well. I won't labour upon this point because I think it's been touched upon a great deal, but we followed the collaborative model and it really is um, endearing to hear how this has almost become the, the paradigm, the standard, as opposed to the abnormal. And um, it's something that really has helped us move forward and galvanise the entire um, community because everybody was recognised from the first year medical student or somebody who hadn't even got into medical school to the dean of medicine. And it really did level the playing field and allow um, everybody's contributions to be um, widely recognised. And I think this is very much appreciated um, by everybody that was involved. And a step forward in really taking down um, a lot of the previous um, norms of publishing. And uh, I think it's very healthy. 
Um, so this research hit the uh, mainstream media around the world and really showed that surgery can transgress into the public eye, as it is actually often very much neglected uh, within part of healthcare. And um, uh, believe it or not, surgery is not part of the official pandemic recovery in multiple countries. And there is no plan around how we sustain surgical services to deliver good care for, um, uh, for, for surgical patients. And what this really does mean is that you end up having a buildup of um, morbidity within the population that is um, uh, not good. It means that patients have to take time off work and they're unable to um, do as much with their lives. They are in more pain and quality of life suffers as well. Um, and what this can do is bring surgery into the spotlight and having things like a social media channel, having good press coverage within mainstream newspapers and news outlets, and also active and dynamic direct communication with not only our collaborators, but also our patients as well, has very much helped us um, really solidify this translation into um, uh, a widespread uh, appeal. And taken together, it helped facilitate and set up um, clean surgical pathways and also testing and vaccination prioritization for patients. We really hope that it really did end up um, improving patients' lives. And um, this translational step really was the missing key that we weren't doing so much before. And, um, and we want to uh, really... Uh, uh, express how much that this has helped us um, deliver our message widely. Um, uh, furthermore, the other aspect as well that we concentrated on was um, patient and public involvement work. And one of my colleagues, Mary Venn from uh, Queen Mary's in London, uh, worked a great deal on uh, these patient leaflets. So we pushed this patient facing material in parallel with the material that was designed more for surgeons and more for guidance and policymakers. And so far, it's been downloaded more than uh, 24,000 times and translated to over 20 languages as well. So by not only innovating in um, the study design and the paper, but the dissemination to clinicians and patients, it has sped up and closed the gap between publication and also widespread acceptance and delivery of um, the, the research message. And um, to reiterate what I mentioned before, before COVID surge, what we used to do was we published a paper and then um, presented it at a conference, perhaps, and um, perhaps uh, did an interview for it. And that was really it. And what we noticed was that these papers were high quality studies published in excellent journals, but the message was very much lost after a very brief amount of time. So we've developed a whole new system of dissemination. Um, including a visual abstract, uh, webinars, as well as a very strong push and communication with our press office for a strong press release, uh, a social media campaign that includes Twitter as well as other forms as well, as and also podcasts as well. So um, you know, on every front, we try to push this out. And um, this is our um, more recent um, uh, uh, a pathway that is online learning modules that really summarize our papers into um, uh, one hour modules and um, users can get CPD points from this. So not only does it help to further uh, uh, education, but also try and um, deliver our message in another platform, another way as well. So what is next for surgery? What we have really noticed from this entire um, experience is that COVID really exposed those uh, weaknesses that already existed in healthcare services. So we had winter pressures that we just about got through every single winter. But what COVID did was just let us know that we did not have any further capacity whatsoever. So we need to think about how we're able to build a more sustainable and resilience, uh, resilient healthcare system that is able to withstand these shocks um, or these black swan events that we never would have foreseen before. So 
for example, surgical cancellations, even before COVID, um, these were very high, 35% reported um, in, in periods of shutdown, especially during winter. Diagnostic capacity is a, another aspect that is a huge bottleneck for surgical services. There are certain countries in the world where there's one CT scanner per four or five million people. So you can imagine that it really is a big restraint on being able to deliver high quality surgery. And also ring fence elective beds as well. So um, one, we, we know this from um, uh, ITU data that one uh, elective surgical patient um, on average takes up about two um, bed days, whereas a COVID patient on average takes up 28. So if you imagine every single COVID patient that gets admitted to ITU, they're essentially blocking 14 elective surgical patients from having their cancer surgery or having um their cardiac operation. And what this means is that sometimes when the um, service is totally inundated, we're really not uh, effectively and efficiently servicing our patients. And we do need some ring fence elective beds so that elective surgery can continue during um, times of um, high pressure. So these are all aspects that we're working on. We're trying to think about how best to address even beyond the pandemic itself. Furthermore, the other aspects that we really are turning our head towards is um, green surgery. Now, this is something that is really very quickly emerging out of um, a lot of different um, societies and countries as well, that surgery is one of the most um, uh, ungreen uh, hospital practices that are, is there, and that we need to now, as a community, start addressing these, um, these aspects of delivering health care so that once again, in the future, this can be more sustainable. And furthermore, what we are also looking at is um, the COVID-19 Omicron variant, as I'm sure many of you are already are involved with uh, COVID-3, that is uh, going to capture data and has started already to um, address this new uh, wave and this quite different variant. We don't know, again, how this is affecting our patients. So we're eagerly awaiting the results of that so that um, we, we can further uh, guide uh, our collaborators. Um, so we really want to thank our collaborators, some of whom um, were collecting data through worn, torn regions of the world or through natural disasters. And it really is a testimony to this expanding network. So uh, moving beyond the needs of the pandemic recovery and into adaptive and sustainable surgery in the future is our aim. Um, a rising tide lifts all the boats. And I think it uh, has very much been demonstrated by everybody that's spoken here and I'm very much looking forward to uh, what Cascade will bring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lee. Um, I'll just remove your slide. Oh, perfect. Just uh, one question from, uh, from us here. Uh, we often find it's a struggle to turn data into outputs. So how did you guys in COVID Surge manage to do it so quickly? And what tips would you give to the audience for similar endeavors? Yeah, so absolutely. So even as we started getting our data together, before we wrote the paper, we started to communicate with uh, journals. And I would suggest that you do that also, um, because it really does help you to get a feel for which journals may be interested, which you which journals may not entirely, and um, where you would be best to direct your um, your efforts towards. Because of course, there's always a lag and delay in journals reviewing your paper, and you really do want to rapidly get this out as quick as possible. So um, if a journal can um, work with you very closely, and they are um, able to deliver a quick review and get your paper out quickly that is a massive bonus and um, we often also tried to um, write our paper so that it was uh, more in line with their style as well and I would definitely recommend even just exploring that before you have um, fully written your paper. Perfect thank you Miss Lee. Um, 